Hi, and welcome to our Aim for Good video series. Uh, we designed Aim for Good with the hope that we could connect individuals in this community and provide different resources to shine light on local nonprofits, people that might be in need, um, any different resources that we could provide out there for you. This uh, video series is intended to provide relevant information um, from industry leaders and also connect and highlight uh, our colleagues, our friends, our clients to nonprofits in need. Please stay tuned at the end of the video as you'll see different links that we discussed during the conversation so that you'll be able to contact them directly and help anyone in need. And also, you know, make sure to subscribe to our channels. We'll be updating these videos on a regular basis. Thanks again for joining us. We'd like to welcome Supervisor Chuck Washington uh, to our video series here today. Uh, Chuck has been a longtime friend of our family. He was actually personally one of my mentors early on when we were trying to open up our foundation 15 years ago and uh, just that uh, watched him through his political career of being, you know, local to Mecola mayor, Marietta mayor. Uh, now he's a supervisor of uh, Riverside County and uh, doing a great job there. Um, too many awards to read off, so I won't, uh, but he's, <laughs> uh, we're, just, we're just excited to have you here today. You know, the whole purpose of our video series is to get, you know, the word out. And uh, right now in this crisis, obviously, you've got a lot of plates spinning, I'm sure, and we really appreciate your time and uh, just looking for some insight here. And I've got Adam joining me to, to go ahead and jump on in and we'll go into a couple questions, if you don't mind. I'd like to give you a quick shout out to Mark. Um, when Kathy and I first moved to Riverside County in 1989 with a six year old who will be 37 next, uh, next month, um, there were probably in Marietta, maybe, I don't know, uh, 25,000 people, if that many, maybe 28 in Temecula. And the people that got involved in the local communities pretty much wore a whole bunch of hats you know it, it started simple you know we joined pta and then okay. and then i became a part of um uh, a part of the you know, site council and then pta council and then people say well this guy he's involved in a lot of stuff and then why don't we ask him and everybody was doing everything and there was a group of about a hundred people in town they were on every committee and you fast forward and when I found out about what you were doing I literally there was a five-year time span where I kept telling your story um, about how you were tackling autism in this valley and helping families and and you just did you did it you took it you ran with it and it's just been awesome you know and i i i don't think any of us ever looked back because now we were starting to see all these people stepping up who wanted to be involved in their communities and they weren't running down to city hall with their hand out hey give me some money so i can do this they were just figuring it out how do i do this so kudos to you thanks jack appreciate the support through the years too so thank you appreciate that well just to jump in chuck uh mark and i have been talking about trying to connect like he said with uh different industry leaders and and for the most part it's a way for us to um introduce some um, a different way to communicate with our clients and our friends and, and colleagues so that uh, we can go uh, directly to someone who knows what's happening um, I get your newsletters every week. I've been checking out your website and I think the information is, is fantastic. And I think it's great. And I think the, you know, maybe the launching off point to this conversation is just how you get the communication and the information out to people and how we can support that. Because yeah. I think we hear and the questions that we get are, um, at times, uh, people are confused, right? I think people hear one thing and they act on another and, uh, my neighbors do different things than, you know, the person on the next street over. So yeah. um, first, I think it's it's great that the information that's getting out there and that I see, and I was wondering, you know, how you're doing that and how you're updating that and how we can kind of so, um, with people. You know, there's pros and cons um, to that story. And, and that story um, right now kind of centers around social media. Social yeah. media is a blessing in that it gives you an opportunity to reach out 
to many people all at once, but it can also be a curse because everyone's doing that and not all of the information is solid information. So one of the things I learned in government uh, back even when I was an airline pilot and a city councilman in Temecula was that this isn't about politics. This is about being a public servant. It's about helping people. It's about getting them the information that they need. And there's never been a, a, a greater need for information than right now in this pandemic. I brought that attitude with me to my county job as a board, as a county supervisor. And so uh, right from the outset, I began to try to structure my office outreach as a public servant type of professional. So I'm probably the only supervisor of the five of us that actually has a dedicated individual who is, I, I call her a PIO, mm -hmm. public information officer, um, but she is actually beyond that because she writes our newsletter. She does a lot of that <clears throat> kind of outreach for my office. And everyone uh, on my team understands our job is not politics. Politics mm -hmm. is me running for the office, getting elected, and then I got to take that hat off and put my public servant hat on. And you guys are all part of that team to disseminate and help people uh, who need information we need help. So that's that's the focus we take in my office. Yeah, and would you say being able to get signed up for the newsletter or things of that nature, that would simply be going to the supervisor's website, right? I mean, and getting sure. all the information yes. there. All right, yeah. so we'll, we'll make sure to put links in this video so that people can have a direct approach to it and uh, we'll let them know what your Facebook page is so they can like you or not like you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, it wouldn't be hard for you to believe, but people do reach out to me uh, from time to time and they want to know, you know, where do you stand on this issue? Where do you stand on that issue? Or, or what's your party? I steer clear of all that stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not here to meet your litmus test. I'm here to provide service to the constituents of my district and the, and the county. So you won't see in um, in my newsletter, you won't see a political agenda expressed. Well, this is the time for us to unif you know, get united and, and focus on what's important for sure. So we appreciate that stance on that front. Um, you know, we hear many things. We, we actually talked to uh, Temecula City Council member Zach yesterday a little bit about it. And it's definitely a coordinated effort between the cities, um, you know, the county and then the state and just trying to get all on the same page as far as what are the true essential businesses, uh, you know, the the health aspect of it as well so we have a couple basic questions for you you know just looking at that from that perspective you know we've got clients and friends and trying to figure out when do we wear a mask when don't we yeah. wear a mask you know um right is that type of criteria being updated on the health site somewhere or anything of that nature or? um the latest uh positioning and, and and guidance is um and i try to boil things down to something simple when you leave your home if you anticipate not being able to maintain social distance, which has been deemed about six feet, then wear a mask. People say, well, I shouldn't have to wear a mask. I'm not sick. Or I shouldn't have to wear a mask because they're not sick. We don't know who's sick. And quite honestly, that's a message that has seemed to fail to get out to the general public that there's probably, and Stanford came out with a, a little bit of research uh, last week, they're guessing that probably four times the number of people who've actually been tested in our population, which is right around 1% has been tested, but 4% is assumed to be contagious or assumed to be infected. Um, and so that other 3% is wandering around in our society asymptomatic they don't have symptoms so that's the danger in that thinking that if i don't feel sick i don't need to wear a mask um it's not a surgical mask so it's not going to probably protect you from someone who's in your face and they sneeze on you mm. but if they're a good four or five feet away from you and you've got a mask on and they've got a mask on it certainly lowers the odds that you're going to get infected 
Well, I saw an article yesterday, and I, I think it's a very positive movement. Hopefully, that's what's going to happen locally. But I mean, these poor people that are on the front lines, including your grocery store workers and everybody else, they seem to be obviously more susceptible to it. But you know. There, I think there's got to be a little bit more action there where they're, they're wearing the mask to protect them and being provided for um, just so if they if, if they go down, then you know, our food source is gone. You know, I mean, there's just yeah. some obvious things there that I think are, are very important. Well, are you aware of any stores that employees are not wearing masks now? Yeah, not that I know of. We've we've really gone the, the route of deliveries from Instacart and other you know, companies like that oh, okay. I haven't seen inside, but um, yeah. I, I talked to a couple of those delivery drivers. They're finally getting masks and stuff from Instacart and stuff, which is crucial. So, yeah. yeah, it was slow to come around. I believe <clears throat> all the grocery stores, though, are now requiring all of their employees to wear masks. Mm -hmm. uh, but I spoke to a friend yesterday. His wife um, is a cashier in the Rouse um, down in the south part of Temecula. And she's working six days a week, 10 hour shifts because so many of their workers have gone out sick. Mm -hmm. Now, my guess is the reason for that is if you go back two weeks ago or three weeks ago, they weren't wearing masks. Right. And there are a number of people in our community who were infected and didn't know they were infected. Right. They're going to the grocery store because they got to eat. People have to eat. But uh, Kathy, my Kathy, not your Kathy, was <laughs> telling me yesterday uh, that she had read an article that some of the grocery store chains are thinking about closing to in-person shopping, uh, that they may move towards um, online orders for delivery or pickup at the store, but not in the store shopping. So I, I don't know if that's gonna happen, but you're right, we, we've gotta have food. You know, that's an essential business. Right, for sure. And are you are you guys not not to kind of put a crystal ball question out there, but are you guys operating on a, a week by week timeline, a, a month by month? How far out are you guys? Um, I guess doing current planning. So um, planning uh, involves several different aspects of, of the virus and the response, <clears throat> but from a COVID nineteen uh, readiness plan. Um, we've been projecting probably out maybe a month in advance uh -huh. because, because, and here's why. Um, we needed to plan for what we thought might be the surge in hospital beds and all of the equipment needed for, by those people in the hospitals. Um, <clears throat> so you go with a two or three day look and you project that out over the next two or three weeks, then you say, okay, here's the number. Mm -hmm. Well, last week we started recognizing mid last week that <clears throat> the actuals that we were project, uh, projecting, say, two or three weeks ago, we were, we were well below that, uh, especially when it comes to hospital beds used, ICU beds used. And so that's good news. I, I think part of the reason for that is the social distancing. It worked. It kept people from getting sick and infected and needing to be hospitalized. And <clears throat> we're starting to understand better that um, the number of people who are infected, not all of them will need to be in a hospital. Many of them, and researchers are still studying it, some think it's genetics, whether you get really sick or not sick. Um, um, but uh, there are people that are out there that are infected but don't need a hospital bed. So we have reduced our projections on that. As far as how many people are infected, we're still guessing because the only way to accurately predict is to actually test people. And we just don't have enough tests. We've not had enough tests um, to find out who is actually infected. Um, but we are ramping up our, te our, our, our testing um, nation, uh, uh, nationally. Uh, I think we're, we're uh, testing about a little over 1%. In the county, we're testing 1.6%. We're striving for 2%. We may get there. It depends on all of the things that go with the testing. It's not just the lab, but it's, you know, it's the swabs, it's the reagents, it's all of those things you need to actually collect, sample, put it in a, in a spot where it can be safeguarded and then sent to the lab. So we're working on that. 
Good. Yeah, testing is the key. That's basically yeah. what we're looking at. If we're going to reopen, that's got to be there. So, well, and it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, oh, really, yeah. how, do you, how do you reopen without knowing who's infected and who's not infected? Yeah, you want to feel safe around everyone if you can. So, it's, it's, and that that's not to say that we have to test everyone. Yeah, but we have to, much like when you see these polls where they say, you know, we called uh, 1,500 people nationwide, and this is what the poll said and it's accurate within three to 4%. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're doing here. We're getting, we're getting a random sampling of people and then we can project out what we think that means for our entire population. No, that's, that's great. Keep up the good work. Uh, yeah, thanks. You know, from a, this has been good on a personal front, you know, I mean, as far as dissecting, you know, there's things are going to change daily, we know, um, and but we're going to definitely work to get the word out for you and for the county and everything else um, from a public state safety standpoint. Um, I had one last question related to the business world, you know, um, obviously businesses are struggling. We've got the federal, you know, grants coming in or loans or forgiveness here and there, you know, are there any county measures or any kind of resources that are on the website related to businesses or anything of that nature? Um, I don't have the website off the top of my head, but um, our county uh, economic development agency um, has links and resources available. Uh, we've been partnering and I did a webinar last week uh, with the SBDC regional manager, Mike Daniel. Uh, we partner with SBDC as well as um, um, just SBA in general. And so those links are on that website. And then of course, if you want the data for um, the COVID numbers, um, you can go to uh, rivcoph.org, rivco for Riverside County and PH for public health, rivcoph.org um, slash coronavirus. And it'll give you all of the latest information so those two websites combined will give you the healthcare side and the economy side. Um, and, and in some respects, the county is much like a lot of, in the same position a lot of businesses are. Um, our revenue is significantly down, as you would imagine. Um, and at the same time, we have to continue providing uh, services to our county residents. We are an essential business if you will. And so we've been cobbling together money here and there. Uh, there was a component of the CARES Act uh, that was going to benefit some of what we do in this latest round that I think is being voted on possibly today. Um, <clears throat> we will probably get something from that somewhere in the neighborhood of $150 million to backfill some of the funding that we've spent on providing those services but we will continue to lead from the front on assisting businesses wherever we can, uh, assisting individuals, families, um, getting um, tested, getting provided health care, um, whatever the need is, um, we will try to get our hands around it and help our R Riverside County constituents. Perfect. Well, feel fortunate to be in Riverside County uh, under your leadership there and with everyone else uh, it, it appears to me we're, we're going down this crazy path together and hopefully in a, a good fashion so uh, Adam did you have anything else you wanted to speak no on? I just appreciate the time and the insight I think um, I mean I'm, I'm on your I'm looking at your website right now I think it's it's all great I just want to do whatever we can to support people that are having a hard time dealing with all this stuff and get them the right information and I would just um, <clears throat> ask that when people are feeling somewhat frustrated and I know they are um, just remember, this is the first pandemic we've had in a hundred years. So we're all new at this. Yeah. Um, and I think if we just stick together, we'll get through this and, um, and, you know, take care of yourself, stay safe. Exactly. Perfect. Well, thanks again for your time, Chuck. We appreciate it. Our best to your family. Stay safe, safe. Likewise, you guys. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you take care. It was wonderful. Right. Have a great day. Take care. You too. Thanks. Okay. Bye.